So in your experiences uh, doing this for the past 10 years, what are, what are some of the highlights that you've had um, working with it? Well, the, uh, the two launches we had were great because those came out of Russia and I was there in person for the second one. And we were on a military base in Russia that would never have been allowed in the United States. And we watched it actually come out of a silo. We stood on a little mound <clears throat> where we were able to see the silo that our rocket was, uh, was uh, launched from. <clears throat> and we weren't supposed to really see that, but I actually had um, uh, <clears throat> some media folks there with me. Um, Liz Clayman and, and her camera crew were there, and they actually zoomed right in on the launch, and they weren't supposed to do that, but they got away with it. We were, we were cut an awful lot of slack uh, in, in the spacecraft integration building. When we take our spacecraft and fit it into the fairing of the, for the rocket, and that's moved out out of the building. Uh, after we had done that, we were playing softball in there, t teaching the Russians how to play softball. And uh, that was a kick. That was really great. They had a brand new dormitory building they had just built, and they were very proud of that. And so we stayed there, uh, and I, uh, you know, for a number of days until the launch occurred, and then for a little while after. And uh, <clears throat> So it was, it was very humbling and very exciting and humbling because we were, we were uh, welcomed and treated so well by the Russians. And uh, also because of the, the uh, there was a small community of maybe 30 some thousand folks adjacent to the base and we went to visit that small community. And they were extremely poor, very poor. The basic industry was uh, mining vermiculite and vermiculite is put into asbestos and that's what the town was living off of as a basic industry and um, so uh, it was that was a fabulous experience all the way around and then we have our own mission control facility <coughs> in Las Vegas at our plant and so for the first launch I was there and watching everybody and cheering along with everybody else uh, first you hope that the rocket succeeds in its launch, and then you hope that your spacecraft deploys and succeeds like, like you think it might. And I thought in both cases that I was prepared for a complete failure. Just psychologically, I thought, well, okay, they're both going to probably <clears throat> auger in, and we're going to have to do it again and again and again. But we had two back-to-back -back successes, and then the data that we got back from the spacecraft was uh, tremendous. It was terrific. And we designed, we had a design life of six months uh, for all of our avionic systems on the spacecraft. And they eventually failed uh, and decayed slowly from radiation and so forth because we didn't invest a lot of money in those particular systems. But we got over two and a half years of perfect data instead of six months. And so and in, in six months, we knew we all, all that we had to know anyway. So it just kept piling on and piling on tremendous amount of data that kept verifying itself over and over and over. So. Now, uh, do you know how long uh, uh, both the Genesis spacecraft are going to be on orbit for? From the time that we launched them, the estimates were 12 years, and then they will automatically orbit, orbitally decay and burn up as they come back in. Now, are either one of those spacecraft equipped with hatches in case a salvage company in the future were to go and collect them? <clears throat> Well, a future salvage company would probably have uh, <clears throat> some sort of large airlock that they would bring a satellite or spacecraft into to capture it. So you would capture the entire spacecraft in its entirety. I see. The Olympus that you referred to earlier, the 2100 meter, has such an airlock. That's true. You could have an Olympus with It will carry an entire spacecraft. It's easy. So, wow. Um, I also wanted to ask about uh, uh, internationally some of the other nations that have expressed interest in mm -hmm. purchasing the BA-33 yep. modules, especially Japan. Yes. They were talking about wanting to connect a module to, their, to the Kibo laboratory. Well, Japan uh, <clears throat> has been very aggressive. Uh, Dubai has, UAE has. Uh, we've, we've gotten very positive signals from Sweden and Singapore uh, and from several other countries. Um, but I think <clears throat> right now, this, this uh, really great recession, as they call it, is, uh, is affecting everybody. And so they're sitting on the sidelines and have told us, we need to get past this recession. We've, we've, we have been 
cutting and reducing our expenses across the board in everything that we're doing as a nation. And uh, we haven't lost our space appetite at all. It's just that it's time to be a little prudent. And we say, yeah, we understand that. And um, we say, as a matter of fact, uh, it looks like the taxi service is, has slowed up and isn't going to be arriving on time either. So uh, with that, it, it, um, it, it stretched our schedule. And we looked at ourselves and said, well, what's the hurry? What are we doing? So uh, we cut uh, our staff by half, a little more than half. And we're still very busy, uh, but it extended our overall dates on when we're going to complete the spacecraft because we don't have the army of folks that we did have. Now, how far along in construction is uh, the expansion at uh, the Las Vegas facility that um, was announced earlier this year? Yeah, that's about 180,000 square feet on a roof. And um, we are about 85% complete. Wow, very good. In fact, about the only thing that's needed to be finished is uh, <clears throat> all the offices, the mezzanine. We have a large mezzanine and um, the commissary area, the dining room and, and uh, large commissary area that we have. So do you guys have any um, uh, space-ready hardware built yet? For full-scale 330, we do. We have, um, <clears throat> we talked earlier about the Sundancer. Mm -hmm. um, we had contracted <clears throat> for all the propulsion systems for two Sundancers. Those can fairly easily be adapted to the 330. So we have complete propulsion systems north and south for two 330s. Well, um, uh, I'd like you to just take a moment and uh, think about is, if there's anything else that you would like to add. We're in this for the long haul. We're committed. Um, we um, are also dedicated to making sure that we have the absolute best, best quality spacecraft that can be engineered uh, and because we are acutely aware that people are placing their lives in our hands and uh, we're very confident that once they get to orbit into our facilities uh, they're going to be well and they're going to be safe. The riskiest part of the journey or the overall uh, experience is going to be <coughs> the transportation up and back. It's no different than you getting in the car and going to the airport. That airplane is going to be a lot safer than you being in your car on the way there. So we, we feel, and we have a lot of reason to feel that way, that uh, <clears throat> our destinations are, are, we have so many redundancies, so many backup systems um, that, uh, you know, and, and ultimately, as has been this case with Mir or the ISS, <clears throat> if there is some kind of a, a uh, urgent necessity, you get in the capsule and you leave. But we have um, a, a far superior uh, habitat than the aluminum modules can provide.